Right, so we are, we should be hopefully live streaming now. A bit of a delay from the six o'clock start that we wanted um, because we had a few technical difficulties. Uh, it's not a problem, okay? We'll still go through from the start and hopefully you can stay with us that extra uh, five, ten minutes that, we, that we've been uh, sort of sorting out our, our technical issues. I'm going to restart my timer here so, so I know exactly where we are, so I know exactly how long to give you the full hour and a half on the feed. So don't worry, okay, we're here, we're live, we're now, we're going to go through it all and this is going to help you tomorrow, okay? So I started off by saying that we've got our email address, uh, I said this in the little warm-up video we had a little while ago, uh, communications at folkestoneacademy.com. Uh, it's the email address you want to know uh, to email in questions. It should be below the live video as well, or it should have a link to it. If you can email questions into this, it's going to make it a lot more interactive and it will allow me to go into more detail on some of the topics. Okay, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly go through a whole range of topics in C1 that I've looked at the exams and I'm trying to predict what will come up, but I can't guarantee these will be the only things. And I don't have time to go into full detail on them. Uh, in the time I've got, so please do ask those questions if you don't understand anything and you want me to give you more detail on any topic. Uh, we had a really good question in the biology stream, which was about auxin, um, plant growth hormone, phototropism and geotropism, um, and it came up in the exam. So it's questions like that that are really worthwhile. Okay? Uh, please do subscribe uh, to the, the revision website because uh, that allows you to access these quicker um, in future. And also, if you're following this um, from the science website, if you found the link there from our science website, you have access to the presentation and the notes there. So uh, you can get the PowerPoint that I'm using and you can follow it along on that. Maybe if you're watching it on a phone and you have a laptop or tablet nearby, you can get both up and you can follow my uh, PowerPoint presentation as well. Uh, and you can see some of the things you maybe can't see as well on the, the, the screen here. Okay? So... I'm going to start off with the fundamentals of chemistry. To understand that, we really need to understand atoms. Uh, atoms are covered a lot by teachers, so we should have a good idea at this point of uh, the, the particles that make up an atom uh, and their electronic structure. So I'm not going to go on it, to it for too long, but uh, I do want to make sure we do know these subatomic particles and the charges of them. Uh, so we need to know the things that make up an atom. There's a diagram down here that I will step out of the way of in a minute. But for now, we've got protons, neutrons and electrons. If you can't see that on the board, we've got protons here, neutrons, electrons. Okay, they're the three subatomic particles. Okay? We need to know the charges of each, and the charges are relatively simple. Okay, the charge of a p -p proton is p -p positive. Okay? Easy way to remember. Proton positive. So that's easy, we should have that one down. Uh, neutron is more tricky. A neutron is neutral. Okay? Don't get confused with an electron, it is neutral or has no charge. Okay? So a neutron has no charge or is neutral, zero charge. And that leaves an electron, which is our negative uh, subatomic particle. So electrons are negative, they have a charge of minus one. Okay? That's their charges. Those aren't too bad to remember. Uh, but we also have their masses. Now the masses of each, okay, the mass of a proton is just one. Okay, it weighs one. You don't need units for it, it's just one atomic unit is all we need. So just one as a number. A neutron also weighs one. Okay, so that has a mass of one. An electron is almost zero. Now, you can also say that it is uh, 1 over 2,000 is its mass. You could say that. Or you could have 1 over 1,860 as its mass. But either way, it's fine. You could say it's almost 0, 1 over 2,000, 1 over 1,860. Whichever sticks with you the best uh, is the one I would go for. Now then when I show you this diagram, you'll see the location of the subatomic particles, but we need to know that protons are found in the nucleus, neutrons are found in the nucleus, and electrons are found in shells that whiz around the outside of the nucleus. They're flying around, constantly moving. Okay? Uh, I said I'd step out of the way, so coming over here, you should be able to hopefully see this diagram, which shows an atom. Um, this is a carbon atom. There's several ways I can tell that. 
And I can tell that because it's got six protons in here and six neutrons. And it also has six electrons, which are arranged uh, in this pattern. Two in the first shell, four in the next shell. And I'll come on to exactly uh, where we get that and how we work that out in a minute. The point I want to make about this though is all atoms are neutral overall and they occasionally ask this, why are they neutral? Um, it's because they have the same number of protons as they do electrons. And going back to over here, I said all protons have a plus one charge and all electrons have a minus one charge so they cancel each other out and that's often work for two marks. If they ask you why are atoms neutral, it's because they have the same number of protons and electrons, and protons and electrons cancel each other out because of the charges. That's what they're looking for for the marks. So we know the subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. We know their charges, per -per protons per -per positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons are negative, and their masses, protons are mass of one, neutrons are mass of one, and electrons almost zero. Okay, so that's their, uh, their masses and their charges, and they're arranged like this. And that leads on to a thing called electronic structure. The most important thing for electronic structure is the 288 rule for drawing the electronic structure. And most of you will know that that means two electrons go into the first shell. Eight electrons can go into the second shell, and eight electrons can go into the third shell. If there's any electrons left over after that, you just add into the next shell, and it will only go up to uh, calcium, which has two in its fourth shell, and it will stop there. That's all we need to know for GCSE. Okay. An example over here is for K, which you might recognise if you know your elements as potassium. Potassium has a pretty full electronic structure, got lots of electrons. Okay, uh, It's actually got 19, and we need to add them in in this order, from the inside out using the 288 rule. So this has two electrons in the inner shell. There's still electrons left over. So that gives us eight in the second shell. Okay, that's used up 10 now. We've still got nine left over. Eight in the third shell. That's used up 18 now. We've still got one left over. So we add that to the fourth shell. So as I said, if you go past this, you just add it to the next shell. This one has one more. Okay. We could do that for lots of atoms. Okay. If we knew oxygen, we found it in the periodic table, we could see, and this is worth talking about, okay, oxygen, symbol O, if you found it in the periodic table, you would see that its atomic number is 8. Okay. Um, and also, you could find its mass number, which would be 16. This number down here is the atomic number, and this number up here is the mass number. That's the way they should appear in your um, periodic table you get in the exam. You will have a periodic table in the exam and do use it. Okay? Um, so, with the mass number, it's always the bigger of the two numbers. Um, and the atomic number is always the smaller and will be at the bottom. What this tells me is the atomic number tells me the number of protons. Okay? So if I was to work it out for oxygen, this has... 8 protons, because the atomic number is 8. If you were listening, I said earlier, for atoms, they always have the same number of protons as they do electrons, because they cancel each other out and make them neutral. So electrons, again, is easy. It's 8. Okay? The only tricks that come in are when you work out the number of neutrons that are there. And to do that, it's a simple sum. You do the mass number, subtract the atomic number. Which in this, in this case, some of you might realise, uh, the mass number being 16, subtract 8, is actually equal to 8 as well. So it has 8 neutrons. Now the number of neutrons is not always the same, so be aware that it doesn't always have to become the same number as these two. You have to do the mass number, subtract the atomic number. So that was a bit about sort of calculating the number of protons and electrons, and uh, I talked about it from atomic structure. So for atomic structure for oxygen, okay, if I put my O in the middle and then I do my first ring and my 
second ring. That's all I'm actually going to need. Now, in an exam, you're very rarely expected to draw the rings. Usually, they give you something that looks like that on the exam paper, and they say, fill in the atomic structure. Okay, you have to look in the periodic table, find how many electrons it has, and then you have to fill them in using the 288 rule. So doing that, I'm going to take two electrons and add them <coughs> to the first shell. And then I've got two away from my eight, so I've got six left over. So I'm going to start filling them in until I've used them up. Now, because I'm still below eight, that's it. It's now completed. And chemists will often put them paired up like this, and then these two they'll put opposite. You don't have to do that. You could draw all six of them together on the same bit of the ring if you liked. It's entirely up to you. It just makes it easier to count if you've paired them up to check that you're correct. Okay? So that's it for oxygen. And we could do any of those. You need to find out the number of electrons it's got using the periodic table. It's the atomic number. And then you need to fill them in in 288 fashion using the rules. Two in the first shell, up to eight in the second, up to eight in the third, and any left over, such as there was for potassium, go in the next shell. Okay. Um, do not miss these questions in an exam. Okay, really don't miss them. There will be a drawing like that, and somewhere on the exam paper will have brackets, two marks. It won't have dotted lines for you to write an answer on, because you're filling it on these rings. And I see so many students just miss those questions out because they don't realise something's being asked. Okay. So they don't think that's a question, and they skip right past it. Okay? So don't miss it out. Things we can learn from this, okay, the groups in the periodic table. So using your periodic table and seeing what group something is in, and groups are the columns in the periodic table. The one you'll have in the exam will actually be uh, labelled, so you will actually see that. Um, that's maybe something we could possibly get hold of uh, at some point, and then we can see if uh, we can look at what it will look like but it has the numbers above the groups, and they are the columns that go down. Okay? You have groups 1 and 2 over on the left-hand side, and then there's a big block in the middle, and then it goes to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 0. Okay? That tells you the number of electrons in the outer shell. Okay? So potassium, okay, potassium itself uh, here has one electron in its outer shell. Okay, it only has one electron in its outer shell. So we would find that in group one of the periodic table. Okay? Oxygen here that I've drawn out actually has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in its outer shell. So that would be in group six of the periodic table. So we can instantly link that together. If an atom has a full out of shell, it is unreactive. Now normally that's only the noble gases, group zero in the periodic table. They have a full outer shell, so they are unreactive. So if you get a question asking you which of these four atoms is unreactive, they'll often give you different drawings like this, four of them, and they'll say which is unreactive. You need to pick one that either ends in two, eight, or eight. Okay, they're, they're what you're looking for to pick up a one that's unreactive. Okay? So that's atoms and electronic structure, and kind of the basics uh, that we need to know. Jumping on to another topic that comes up a lot in C1 is hydrocarbons. Okay, we've got hydrocarbons, a really big topic. Okay, there's loads we could do on this, uh, so I'm going to try to go over the sort of basics of it. First of all, I don't have it on my slide, but you need to know that a hydrocarbon is a substance that contains hydrogen and carbon only. Okay, so hydrocarbon contains hydrogen and carbon only. Hydro, carbon, okay? Contains hydrogen and carbon only. And the reason I make a big point of the only is that's usually worth the second mark in your definition. Okay, the first one the clues in the name, hydrocarbon, hydrogen and carbon. That's one mark. And the second mark is usually for saying only if they've asked you to define what is a hydrocarbon. There's two main types we need to know. Okay, There's two main types of hydrocarbon. There are alkanes 
and there are alkenes. They are the two types of hydrocarbon. Alkanes and alkenes. Two main types of hydrocarbon. Both only contain hydrogen and carbon, but different types. And we need to know a bit about them. Okay, so alkanes, okay, they contain only single bonds. Okay, so that means when you draw them out, they'll only have single lines in between them. Okay, that's a key fact about them. Uh, they're called saturated hydrocarbons because the saturated means they've got as much hydrogen as possible. Uh, and that's why they only have single bonds. Okay, so they're saturated <coughs> hydrocarbons. And their general formula, which I'll draw up on here in case it's a bit small there, is CnH2n plus 2. Now that sounds really confusing. Okay, CnH2n plus 2. Okay, that's called their general formula, and sometimes you have to give that. What that means is, I've got an example of three alkanes down the bottom here. And we'll go with propane. Okay, that's an alkane. I can tell because it ends in A. Now, with this, if we count the number of carbons, we have one, two, three carbons. So our N for propane is three. Okay, so if we were to do it for propane... N would be 3. Okay. Now, the number of hydrogens is equal to twice the number of carbons, so 2 times 3 is 6, plus another 2, so that would be H8. N would be the number of hydrogens in propane. And if we count it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, we know we're right. And we can draw out that structure. The way to draw it, you occasionally get asked to draw um, hydrocarbons, alkanes, is you do the number of carbons and then you draw four lines coming off each carbon and the carbons in the middle must join together and then add hydrogens all around the outside. That's the way to draw them. And there's also a way, I remember, the order, which is methane, ethane, propane, and after that you get butane. I say monkeys eat peanut butter. Monkeys, methane, eat, ethane, peanut, propane, butter, butane. Okay, butane, if you're wondering how you spell it, uh, I'll just write it up here. Uh, it's like this. Okay. And because I know monkeys eat peanut butter, that's the fourth one, so I'm going to know it's got four carbons. Okay, so I know that from monkeys eat peanut butter, butane must have four carbons. And I can work out the number of hydrogens without a drawing by doing 2 times 4 plus another 2 gives me 10. Okay. And I could draw it out as well if I needed to, okay, with all single bonds because it's an alkane. So monkeys eat peanut butter is a way of remembering your order of uh, alkanes. It also works for alkenes as well, uh, except you don't get uh, methane. And there's a reason I'll talk about briefly about that. So alkenes, okay, what's important about them is they contain a double bond. So they have a double bond linking together two carbons. They're said to be unsaturated, unsaturated hydrocarbons. And their general formula uh, is CnH2n. So it's just double the number of hydrogens as you've got uh, carbon. So if I take the example here of ethene, Okay, ethene, it has two carbons. So ethene, C2, it's got two carbons in it. I know that from monkeys eat, okay, two carbons. Um, and then my number of hydrogens is just twice the amount. So H4, I just double it, okay. And when you're drawing these out, you have to put an equal sign, or it's a double bond, between two of the carbons, okay. With ethene, it's the only two you've got, so it just goes in the middle. Okay? And that counts as two bonds, so this carbon still only has four bonds, one, two, three, four, so I've drawn it correctly, and same this type, one, two, three, four, so I've drawn it correctly. Uh, propene over here, it has one equal sign, and the others just join together with single bonds, okay? and that's how you draw them out. But they are more tricky to draw out, uh, these alkenes, rather than alkanes. Um, 
while I'm here, one thing, an important bit you know about it, is a test for alkanes or alkenes. It actually tests to see whether it's saturated or unsaturated. You use a chemical called bromine water. Okay? So you actually use a chemical called bromine water test for alkenes or alkanes. Okay? And bromine water is an orange colour. Okay? So if you've got an alkane, which is saturated, if you add bromine water, it will be orange at the start, and it will change to orange. Okay? It doesn't change colour. So it stays as orange, or there's no colour change. Whereas if we have an alkene, which is an unsaturated hydrocarbon, uh, it starts as orange, always starts as orange, and it goes colourless. And it's very important you say colourless, not clear. Clear means you can see through it, it doesn't mean it's got no colour. So that means it goes colourless. Okay, that's what you have to say for an alkene. It's a test to see if it's unsaturated. Bromine water with an alkene or an unsaturated hydrocarbon will go orange to colourless. Okay, very important test. Right, those hydrocarbons, okay, moving on to where we get these hydrocarbons from. Most of the hydrocarbons we get uh, come from uh, crude oil, which is a thick, black, horrible substance, not very useful for many things. So we have to separate it into what it's made up of, because crude oil is a mixture of many things. Okay? Crude oil is then all, all in a bit, big, thick tar, and we actually use fractional distillation, which is this apparatus here, to separate it out. And sometimes you have to describe how fractional distillation works or takes place. Okay? So this is the fractional distillation column, and at different levels, different materials come out. Now, you probably can't read those, but it doesn't matter. You don't need to know what actually comes out at the different levels. You just need to know how the process works. If they're asking you about these things, then they will tell you what they are. Um, you could know some uses, but generally you've got petrol, which is fuel for cars. You've got uh, naphtha, which is used for making chemicals. Kerosene, which is used for aircraft fuel or jet engines. Diesel oil, which can be used for machinery or cars. Uh, fuel oil, which is for ships and power stations. And then residue comes out the bottom, which is used for roads and roofs. Okay, because it's like a thick material that waterproofs stuff. So this is the fraction of the station column, and how, it, how does it actually work? Well, what I'm going to go for is steps. Again, like I did for the B1. Um, you can actually talk about these points in an exam if you're asked to describe what was happening in fractional distillation. Okay? First step in fractional distillation is crude oil is pumped into the bottom. So you have your crude oil pumped into here. Okay? It is then heated up to 350 degrees Celsius, which is very hot. Okay? And what happens to substances when they're hot? They actually evaporate. So the mixture evaporates. And when it evaporates, it turns to a gas and it rises up the column. Okay? As it rises up the column and evaporates, it cools down. So as it gets higher, it actually gets cooler, cools down. Now, when the material goes below its boiling point, or goes back to its boiling point, it actually condenses back to a liquid. So it becomes a liquid again. And that's what's being collected at each of these stages. Okay? So the crude oil is pumped in, heated up to 350 degrees Celsius. Most of the things in it evaporate and rise up. And as they do, they cool down. And then they condense back to a liquid and they run off. Okay? These are called fractions, hence it's called fractional distillation. And they're not pure substances, they're mixtures. Okay? So they have boiling ranges rather than boiling points because they're mixtures of hydrocarbons. Okay, but you get gases come out of the top, things that don't condense back to a liquid, and then you get your different layers, different fractions. Okay? Taking it a bit further, as I said, I'm not going to go into detail unless I get asked particularly on it, but the things up the top have shorter um, 
hydrocarbon chains. And the things at the bottom uh, have longer hydrocarbon chains. Okay? So these things here have short hydrocarbon chains, not many carbons. And the things that are down here have long hydrocarbon chains. Okay? Uh, we have got a question coming, okay? but we'll, we'll get to it when I get to my uh, like little question bit in a few minutes. Okay? So going back to this, the things that go up to top have very short carbon chains. They don't have many carbons in them. And the things down the bottom are really long carbon chains, have long carbon lengths of carbon in. Now when I say long, I mean even longer than propane. We're talking about, this has three carbons. We're talking about things with um, 100 carbons, like long, would stay down the bottom. And these would only have sort of one to four length of carbons in them. The things that you may need to know about these is these things up the top, they have lower boiling points. Okay? They, um, they're easier to burn and catch fire, so they burn more easily, and they burn with a cleaner flame, so they don't produce much smoke. Whereas the things down here are hard to burn, hard to light, and they produce really smoky flames when they're burned. Okay? That's kind of some of the main points about the fractions from fraction distillation. But like I say, that is a bit that I could go into more detail on, but I'm leaving it for now. As long as you know this process of how fractional distillation works, that's what's important. Okay. Um, now, some of the things they get from fractional distillation are really long hydrocarbons. And when I say long, I mean lots of carbons in their length. Okay. So lots and lots of carbons in their length. Uh, this is an example of a long hydrocarbon. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in that chain. Okay. Um, so we've got a seven, length, uh, seven carbon length chain there. Um, I said that was hard to burn. It doesn't light very easily. And if it did, it would give a smoky flame. So we don't want to use that as a fuel. We want shorter hydrocarbons, shorter alkanes, that we can use as fuels. And we can actually use alkenes. We can get alkenes from this process used to make polymers. Okay? I'll come to polymers in a minute, but to get those shorter alkanes and alkenes, we actually do a process called cracking. And it's a really important process. It literally is just taking your long hydrocarbon and cracking it into smaller bits. So you're cracking it up, okay? Now, this one's got seven carbons in it. So when we crack it, we need to have hydrocarbons added up to seven carbons long, okay? Hopefully the noise from the uh, windows decided to close that point, didn't put you off. So we've got a long hydrocarbon with seven carbons, um, and we need seven carbons out at the end. Okay? Uh, in this case, we've cracked it into one, two, three, four, five, which is actually called pentane, uh, and ethene here with a double bond. You could draw the balanced equation for that. Balancing equations, though, I will say, are generally very tough. For cracking, you should be able to do them. I'll show you how in a minute. Before we do though, the conditions needed to crack up that hydrocarbon, so the conditions are important. Very simple though, you need a very high temperature, so really, really hot. Okay? You can say lots of heat, high temperature, above 500 degrees Celsius, all of those are good. And you also need to add a catalyst, okay? you add in a catalyst. A catalyst comes up more in C2, but it's something that speeds up the reaction. So you need to add a catalyst and a high temperature to this reaction. And you'll actually be able to crack these long hydrocarbons, which aren't very useful because they can't be burnt very easily and they produce smoke <coughs> and flames, into small hydrocarbons, um, which can be used as polymers, which I'll talk about in a second, and fuels that you can burn. Okay? I said I'd look at how you balance the equation for cracking, and it occasionally comes up. Okay? What you do for that, in this example, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons, and that would usually be given to you. So we're starting with C7, and then because it's an alkane, do you know how I can tell? Because all of the bonds are single bonds. I know it's going to be twice the number of carbons, 2N, plus another 2. So 2N would be 14, plus another 2 gives me 16. Let me check, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. Now when you crack, okay, you don't add anything to it, but you put an arrow. And you might put a catalyst on here, you can put it above the arrow, and you might put 
a high temperature or I'm going to put 500 degrees Celsius on my hand to show it's really hot. And then the products. Okay? In an exam, they, I've seen them do this. They give you one of the products, um, like this, so they'll give C5H12, and then they'll have a line for you to write the other product. It seems like it's going to be difficult, but it's actually really simple. All you need to do is make sure there's the same number of carbons this side as there are this side. So how many carbons have I got left over if I started with 7 and 5 are in that? That will be C2. And how many hydrogens have I got left over? If I've got 12, uh, I had 16 to start. I'm going to have 4. And also, another bit of information I can get from this, I know this is an alkene because it's got the general formula CnH2n because it's twice the number of hydrogens as it's got carbon. So I can already tell that I've made an alkene from that process. Okay? So that's how I could balance the reaction for cracking. Okay? That's cracking. Right, I've done about half an hour. I'll come on to quite some questions in a second. I just want to finish this last bit, as I said, using an alkene. Uh, I can make a polymer, which is called polymerization. If polymerization comes up, there's a few definitions you need to know. Okay, a monomer means single units. So monomer, mono means one. Okay, well I've got a mono brow. If I've waxed recently, um, then I'll have a single eyebrow. Okay, they're the single units. Mono means one. Okay, these are always alkenes in GCSE, so they're always alkenes are used as monomers to make a polymer. And a polymer, polymer means lots of units, okay? Poly means lots. Um, these are used as plastics, so polymers are our plastics. Um, and you, you could know some of the, the good points and bad points about plastics, they're non-biodegradable, um, and but they are useful because they're strong, uh, lightweight, things like that. But the only bit I wanted to say about polymers is really how you draw a polymer from a monomer or vice versa, okay? This is an example on a board of a polymerization reaction. It's really, it's joining together lots of the alkenes to make a long chain. And the way you draw it is this is the monomer, which has a double bond, so it's an alkene. It has three hydrogens on it and one chlorine. It doesn't matter what are on these, okay, but that's the way it should be drawn. And then when you draw your polymer, you draw out the same thing in the middle. See, that's the same thing in the middle but with a single bond in it, not a double bond. You draw two lines which must come out of brackets that go around it, okay? And you've drawn your polymer. The last thing to point out is the N, okay? N stands for a large number, a number above 100. It means if you take 100 monomers and you link them together, you will make a polymer that's 100 units long. But you just need to know N is a large number. They could also ask you to give the name of uh, a polymer. And really, if this is chloroethene, okay, this is what this name is, chloroethene, and they would give you that, the polymer is just called polychloroethene. Okay? We know that as PVC, because actually some people call this vinyl chloride. But the <coughs> name you would have to give would just be put poly in front of that. And you can do that the other way as well. You could have this polymer given to you, and you have to take it out the brackets to say the monomer, you just draw it again without the brackets, without the lines, and put a double bond in between. So polymerization is the joining together of alkenes to make a really long chain to use as a plastic. Okay? This is how you draw the polymer from a monomer, or the monomer from a polymer. Okay? Remember, N stands for a large number if it comes up. So I've done just over half an hour, so if we've got some questions, we have had one come in. Uh, we'll just see if any more have come in, and I'll try and answer those as we go. So, has there been any more questions? No, I have seen one question. Okay, so hopefully should have a question email that I can bring up uh, and we can have a look at. So we did have a question about uh, elements, compounds and mixtures, which are some key words uh, needed for uh, the exam. So 
What elements, compounds and mixtures do we need to know for the exam? Now you don't need to know specific element, compounds and mixtures, but you need to be able to recognise them. Uh, definitely be able to recognise them. In terms of elements, it's not too bad. The definition of an element is a substance made up of only one type of atom. Okay, so that's the definition of an element. Substance made up of only one type of atom. <coughs> That's an element. Now, you can tell if you've got an element because it will be on the periodic table you have in the exam, the periodic table of elements. Okay? So look for the name there and that will be your element if you're trying to identify an element. A compound. A compound is... made up of more than one type of atom, chemically joined together. So, made up of more than one chemically bonded <coughs> and for that, that will usually, if you're trying to identify it by its name, have a name that you recognise uh, before, like carbon dioxide, uh, water, uh, ammonia is one they could ask you about, methane, any of those hydrocarbons, because they're carbon and hydrogen bonded together. So, those are compounds made up of more than one type of atom, chemically bonded together. It's important that they're chemically linked. Because, the difference to that in a mixture, is a mixture is made up of more than one type of atom or compound, uh, not chemically joined together. So a good example of a mixture would be crude oil. Okay, they're not chemically joined together in crude oil. You get the different fractions. Or a really common one is air. And we'll talk about air a bit later. So air is a mixture made up of different gases. Nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide. It's a mixture of substances not chemically joined together. Okay? So hopefully that answers what elements, compounds and mixtures do you need to know. You need to know the definitions of them. And you should be able to identify them. Uh, from, like I said, the periodic table of elements will tell you if it's an element, a compound, the name you should recognise, or they'll have more than one element named in it, carbon dioxide, um, and they'll be chemically bonded together. Okay? So, <coughs> going back to the presentation, if we do have any more questions come in, we'll go back to them. But thank you very much uh, for your question, Alicia. Right, so we looked at polymerization, we looked at how you draw polymers from monomers, monomers from polymers, um, so we've got some good stuff there. Okay. Next thing I want to go on to is what happens when you burn a fuel, and that fuel could be a hydrocarbon fuel, most likely is, uh, but not always, but most likely is. When all fuels burn, when you burn any fuel, it will react with oxygen that's found in the air, that's the important bit it will react with oxygen in the air. And there's two types of burning, or scientifically com called combustion, that you should know. Okay? You get complete combustion. Okay? Complete combustion is where you have lots of oxygen around, enough oxygen for the substance to burn completely. Okay? So it's burned completely, that fuel, and when it does, it releases two substances. It releases carbon dioxide, and it releases water. This happens when we burn coal as a fuel in a power station, or we burn petrol in our cars. Um, all of those substances produce carbon dioxide and water, as long as they're supplied with enough oxygen for them to burn completely. It's called complete combustion, where there's lots of oxygen available. Okay? If there's not enough oxygen available, you get what's called incomplete combustion, not enough oxygen available. The fuel still burns with the oxygen, and it releases carbon monoxide, water, and sometimes it can release carbon as well as a byproduct. That carbon will often be soot, so you'll get like black sooty like substances uh, formed on things. So if you're burning something, you know it's incomplete 
if you get lots of soot formed or smoke uh, produced. Okay? Carbon monoxide, it's mono because mono is only one again, like we said before, and that means there wasn't enough oxygen for it to make dioxide, di meaning two, CO2 probably know it as. Uh, so if there's not enough oxygen to make carbon dioxide, two oxygens, we make carbon monoxide, one oxygen. You need to know a bit about these products and what they're like and the effects they have on us, our health, and on the environment as a whole. Often I see students write questions to answers where it says, uh, answers to questions I should say, where it says what's the problem of burning this fuel or something to that effect. And they will say pollution. You can't get marks for that in an exam, you need to be specific. An environmental problem is not just pollution, you need to say what pollution. If it's burning a fuel and it's complete combustion, it will produce carbon dioxide. And we should, hopefully, always when we think carbon dioxide, we think global warming, or greenhouse effect, or climate change. All of those key words are great. Okay? Carbon dioxide leads to global warming. You need to say that. Be definite with your answer. In incomplete combustion, it's maybe even worse. It produces carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is poisonous to us as human. Uh, it actually binds to our haemoglobin and actually stops us being able to get oxygen. So it's actually poisonous. So carbon monoxide uh, is poisonous. Carbon dioxide leads to global warming. If they're asking you an environmental reason or give an environmental reason or an environmental disadvantage for something, a good bet is usually it releases carbon dioxide and that leads to global warming. That's a good tip. So if you're, if you're looking for an environmental problem with anything really, a fuel, um, how to extract a metal, it's usually going to release carbon dioxide and that usually means, well always means, global warming, climate change, greenhouse effect. So remember that, link those two together. Uh, some other things that can be released, gases, pollutants that can be released from burning fuels are sulphur dioxide. Okay? Sulphur dioxide can be spelt, or sulphur can be spelt with a pH or an F, doesn't matter. Okay? Sulphur dioxide though, you need to link it with one environmental problem. And that environmental problem is acid rain. So whenever you see a question that's involving sulphur or sulphur dioxide, you need to link it to acid rain. Those should be the link you have in your head. Carbon dioxide, global warming. Sulfur dioxide, acid rain. Carbon monoxide, poisonous to humans. Nitrogen oxide, now this does cause acid rain as well, but because I really want to make you make that link between sulfur dioxide and acid rain, nitrogen oxide, I would link it to, it leads to asthma attacks. So it's bad because it leads to asthma attacks. Uh, it's also poisonous as well. But asthma is a good one for nitrogen oxide. And then last of all, you've got particulates. Particulates are tiny little particles of dust or soot or carbon uh, that are in the air. Because incomplete combustion creates carbon, that can lead to particulates when you burn a fuel. These um, can be carried out into the air, and we can actually breathe these in, and they can actually lead to lung cancer. So you can actually say that causes lung cancer particulates. Okay? So bear that in mind. Sulfur dioxide, acid rain. Nitrogen oxide, asthma attacks, particulates, lung cancer, carbon dioxide, global warming, carbon monoxide, poisonous. Okay? These are all pollutants you can get from burning fuels. Whenever you burn a fuel with the acid with oxygen, if it's complete, lots of oxygen around, it goes to carbon dioxide and water. If it's incomplete, it goes to carbon monoxide and water. Sometimes carbon as well. Okay? So that's what happens when you burn a fuel. Okay? Alternative fuels we could use to solve some of those problems. Okay? So if you get a question looking at what's called alternative fuels, or any of these named fuels I'm going to talk about, this is to do with the differences between these pollutants and these fuels. Now, biodiesel is a really common one that comes up. Biodiesel is made from vegetable oil, which you extract from plants. And I'm going to go into how we extract that from plants a little bit later. Okay? But you extract biodiesel oil, uh, vegetable oil, from the plant. 
good thing is about it, it is carbon neutral. It's a big benefit to it. Okay? It's carbon neutral. Now you need to understand what that means. When you burn any fuel, what did I say it released? Carbon dioxide and water, if there's enough oxygen. Biodiesel is no different. When you burn it, it does release carbon dioxide. But it's carbon neutral because it's made from vegetable oil extracted from plants. And what do plants take in when they grow? Carbon dioxide. So it's carbon neutral because it's taking in the same amount of carbon dioxide to grow the plants that you release when you burn the fuel. So overall it's said to be carbon neutral. Okay? It doesn't change the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by any amount. Because the plants take it in, and when you burn the fuel it's released. The new plants take it in, and then it's released. It's also renewable. A big problem that I didn't mention with these fuels that come from hydrocarbons, so I released in fractional distillation, all of these fuels uh, here, a big problem with them is they are running out. We are running out of crude oil. Okay? So that's a big problem with these fuels. We're running out of crude oil, so we need other fuels, alternatives. And biodiesel would be renewable. You can always grow more plants to get more biodiesel. So that's another benefit to it. Uh, it also, another benefit that's just come into my head, is it doesn't contain any sulphur. So whereas fuels from hydrocarbons, crude oil, actually contains sulphur in it, when you burn it, that makes sulphur dioxide, which we've linked in our minds to acid rain. Biodiesel doesn't contain sulphur, so it doesn't produce sulphur dioxide. So no chance of acid rain. Um, the real bad thing to biodiesel is, though, we need a lot of land to grow crops, to make enough oil to power all the cars and heat all the homes that we have uh, in the country, in the world, you could say. And because we would use a lot of land that would usually be used to grow crops for food, it could lead to food shortages. Okay, that's one bad side to it. We would be growing like wheat normally, but now we can't grow that wheat because we're using it to grow biodiesel plants, plants for vegetable for biodiesel. Okay? Um, so that's a big downside. Also, another one could be, if we want lots of land to grow crops, we actually cut down areas of uh, habitats. We destroy habitats so we can grow these plants for vegetable oil, because it takes a lot of space. So that's another bad side to it, destroying habitats. Another one is ethanol. Now, I'm not going to go into, in the time I've got, the two ways of producing ethanol in great detail. The only thing I'm going to say, and we'll put them up here briefly, is the two methods are fermentation and hydration of ethene. Okay? Fermentation is one process, and this is the way they used to produce alcohol they would use in beers and wines and spirits. Uh, which I'm sure none of you will know anything about, so that's fine. But So we'll go into the process. Uh, you actually need sugar, which is glucose. And you use a catalyst, and that catalyst is yeast. Okay? So you use a yeast catalyst. Uh, and you keep it warm, because yeast is a microorganism, it's living. So it's about 37, 35 degrees uh, centigrade. And it actually produces ethanol uh, as a byproduct. Uh, of its respiration. And it also gives out some carbon dioxide as well, uh, which I'm just going to put as CO2. Okay? So that's fermentation. Okay? It's good because uh, to get the sugar needed to do fermentation, you actually grow it from crops. So it can be carbon neutral, because sugar comes from sugar cane, which is a plant. So again, it means when you burn this ethanol fuel, it will release CO2, but that CO2 will be taken in by the sugar cane used to grow the glucose. Okay? That's one method of producing it. It's also renewable because you can always grow more sugar cane to produce the glucose. But the downside is, again, it uses land. Land, uh, land to grow the crops, which you would normally grow food. So it's actually taking up space for food and destroying habitats again. The same problems. Hydration of uh, ethene is actually this process where you take ethene and those of you who have been following along might recognise where we get ethene from 
we actually get it from cracking long hydrocarbons, which we obtain from crude oil. So ethene comes from crude oil. And you can probably realise that the problem with using a fuel from crude oil is that crude oil is running out. Um, I shouldn't have actually drawn an arrow there because I actually needed something. I needed to add water. Okay? It's actually as steam. Okay, so you add steam to it. And when you add that steam to it, you actually just make ethanol. Good thing about that process is it gives you pure ethanol straight away. Okay? So you get the ethanol pure right uh, immediately. So you don't need to purify it. It's also a continuous process. So it's always happening. It's always going on. But it's bad because you have to get the ethene from crude oil and we're running out of crude oil. This process is good because it comes from glucose, which is, comes from sugar, uh, well, which is sugar, I should say, which comes from plants. Uh, but the ethanol you produce is not pure. It's actually mixed with water, which to separate, you have to do distillation on uh, to separate that out. But that's a basic overview. I won't go into any more details on it right now. Okay. Um, that's ethanol, two ways of producing it, and why it can be used in alternative fuel. The other alternative fuel you need to know is hydrogen. Okay, hydrogen. Okay, uh, it releases water when it's burnt, so it doesn't release any CO2, which is a great thing. Okay, because CO2 leads to—I'm sure you're screaming at your screens right now—global warming. Okay, so it doesn't produce CO2; it only produces water when it burns. The downsides to that though are, although it releases a lot of energy, which is actually a positive, it's explosive when it releases that energy. So if you were to try and store it in your car, you've essentially filled up your car with an explosive. And if you had a crash, that could lead to problems, obviously. Also, hydrogen is a gas, so that makes it hard to store. You can't go to a petrol station and fill up your car with a gas because it would all just float out. So it makes it very hard to store store the hydrogen um, inside. Okay, So that's some alternative fuels, a little bit about them. Another thing about hydrogen is, is it takes a lot of energy to extract it. It does actually, main source it comes from can be from water as well, so that's a good thing, but it takes a lot of energy to extract it out and that uh, costs money to, to you to create that energy to do it. Um, <coughs> That's about alternative fuels. We did about burning normal fuels and some of the pollutants. These are some of the solutions to it. None of them are perfect. You often have to debate the pros and cons of each uh, and say what's good and what's bad about each thing. Okay. Limestone cycle. Okay, so we've got the limestone cycle here, uh, which you should have in your revision guides if you uh, haven't downloaded the slides. And uh, you can see, you can find for yourself anyway. Um, the point is limestone is actually scientifically called calcium carbonate. So limestone is called calcium carbonate. Um, limestone is the thing that you find in the ground and you quarry it out, you mine it out. Yeah, the good, it can be used for lots of different things. It can be used for a building material, it can be used to make cement or mortar um, and lots of different things like that. It can actually be used to uh, neutralise certain things as well. Calcium carbonate is its scientific name, and that's its formula over there, CaCO3 is its scientific formula. Um, you can, it can go all the way through what's called this cycle. The first stage in that cycle is where you heat it up, so you actually heat up calcium carbonate. And when you heat it up, it actually breaks down to make two substances. It actually makes calcium oxide um, and carbon dioxide is released. Okay. This process is called thermal decomposition. And you could be asked about a range of carbonates um, undergoing thermal decomposition. The word the thermal decomposition just comes from thermal, meaning heat, and decomposition to break something down, to decompose it. So our reaction is actually calcium carbonate being heated up to a very high temperature to produce calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Okay? Now, 
That process can be used for any metal carbonate, really. I could have had zinc carbonate to produce zinc oxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, I could have had magnesium carbonate to make magnesium oxide, carbon dioxide. They always produce carbon dioxide, but the name of the metal at the start could change. I've used calcium, though, calcium carbonate, because calcium carbonate is limestone. And that's the step in this uh, limestone cycle to make calcium oxide here. After that, what we can do with that calcium oxide is we can actually add water to it. We add a small amount of water, and it actually makes calcium hydroxide, which can be called slaked lime. Um, this is the reaction. You've got calcium oxide, which is CaO, plus water goes to calcium hydroxide. And that's the next step in the process, just by adding a small amount of water and make slaked lime. We can then add a lot of water. So you add a substantial amount of water and you actually filter off any solid that's left in it. So you add lots of water and you filter off anything that's left, any solid that's in there. And you actually make a calcium hydroxide solution. And that solution is called lime water. That's the name of it, lime water. Uh, so you've taken calcium hydroxide, you've added lots of water, and you've made it to calcium hydroxide solution, lime water. And lime water is a test for carbon dioxide. And that's where if they ask you about thermal decomposition of carbonates, they can ask you about a practical they do. And the practical looks a little something like this. You have a tube which is tilted, and in that tube you have a bump which has a delivery tube in it which curls round like this. Okay, so that's my bump with the delivery tube in it. And in the bottom of here, I put my carbonate. So I put my carbonate in the bottom. That's my metal carbonate. Okay, so if I put that in there, and I supply heat, so I need to put a lot of heat on that. Uh, so I'm gonna heat it up with a Bunsen burner uh, and get it really hot. And it will undergo thermal decomposition. It gives out two substances. This, the solid, will change to calcium uh, oxide or metal oxide, uh, whichever metal I'm using. And the gas that goes through here will be carbon dioxide. And the test for carbon dioxide is actually using lime water. So if I have another test tube there, and I have lime water in here. <coughs> okay, so that's my lime water in the tube. This will actually go cloudy if carbon dioxide is produced, because what happens is it actually goes back to calcium carbonate, and the cloudiness is due to calcium carbonate being formed uh, in the solution. So you get calcium carbonate here, but the lime water goes cloudy if CO2 is present. Okay. So that's thermal decomposition and the setup for it. Okay. Uh, we still haven't any questions come in. I mean, that's fine. I'll still carry on going through bits. But if you do have a specific question on anything I've asked or anything I haven't talked about, uh, then please do ask it, uh, and I can go through that at the end. Okay. Uh, otherwise, like I say, this is the limestone cycle. Uh, calcium carbonate heated up, thermal decomposition makes calcium oxide. Calcium oxide you add water to to get calcium hydroxide. You add more water and you actually filter what's in there to get lime water, calcium hydroxide solution. And then if we add carbon dioxide, we take it back to calcium carbonate and it can go around the cycle again. Okay? So that's the overall process of the limestone cycle that you've got there. Uh, as I say, limestone can be used as a building material, can you make cement and mortar uh, and concrete. Uh, and there's lots of different things you can do with it. Uh, that you do need to know a bit of how you make each of those. Moving on to extracting metals, which is a big topic uh, in C1, okay? uh, and how to actually extract those metals. There's a few that you need to recognise and be able to talk about. Okay? One of the big ones is extracting iron, because iron is a useful metal. Not just as iron, but as, a, as actually as an alloy of iron, uh, called steel, uh, that you might recognise. But to get that iron, we need to extract it from its ore. Um, and metal ores are another definition you need to know. So the definition of what is a metal ore. 
all spelt like that. Uh, it is a rock that contains enough metal to make it worthwhile to extract. What that means is, if you have a rock with only 50 pounds of metal in it, you could sell it for 50 pounds, and it cost you 200 pounds to extract it out of that rock, that wouldn't be worthwhile. It wouldn't be worth your time or your money to do it. A metal ore contains enough metal so that it is worthwhile. So that rock contains 500 pounds, dollars, whatever you want to, currency you want to use, of iron in it and it will cost you less to extract it out than you can actually sell it for afterwards. Okay? So that's a metal ore. We extract iron from its ore, and to do that we have to mine the rocks out the ground, uh, and we mine the rocks out, uh, and we actually then get iron oxide, and we have to extract the iron from the iron oxide. Uh, this process is called reduction with carbon. It takes place in a blast furnace, of which this is a diagram, so we've got a blast furnace here. Uh, iron gets put in, iron ore, along with coke, which is a scientific name for, or a less scientific name I should say, for carbon. We also put limestone in, so it's another use for limestone, that's to actually purify it, pur purify the iron. And then it gets heated up, so hot air is pumped in, so it gets really hot. That actually causes the carbon to reduce the iron, it actually takes the oxygen out of the iron oxide. That's why it's called a reduction, because you're actually taking the oxygen out. And you're left with iron and carbon dioxide produced. Okay? That's the process that's going on inside the blast furnace. Now, you can do this because iron is less reactive than carbon. You cannot do it with metals that are more reactive than carbon in the reactivity series. And you'll get a reactivity series in, in the exam. It's on the other side of your data sheet, which has the periodic table on it. So if the metal is lower than carbon in the reactivity series, you can extract it using this process, which is called a reduction with carbon. For iron, iron oxide gets mixed with carbon, and carbon can be called coke. That's what they call when they put it into the blast furnace. It creates iron, and carbon dioxide is produced. This is actually cast iron, is the name of the iron that's produced. Now, cast iron, isn't particularly useful on its own because it's actually uh, too brittle and not very good. So they actually turn it into an alloy uh, which is called steel, uh, which has lots of uses. Advantages to steel is that it's a lot stronger than iron uh, and it has a lot more things it can be used for. Okay? Um, if you think about that logically, iron is more malleable, it can be bent easier than uh, steel. Uh, the alloy is stronger. So if you were building a bridge and you build it of iron, there's a chance that with enough weight that could bend or buckle or even break. Uh, and that would obviously lead to a catastrophe. Whereas steel is a lot stronger, so it's less likely to do it. You need to know why that is as well. And this does come up in C2, but I'm going to talk about it now. If we have a pure metal, okay, so if you have a pure metal, and you looked at its structure, it would be arranged in layers. And those layers that are arranged can actually slide over each other. The layers can slide. And that makes it sort of malleable, able to be bent. Because the layers can slide, so it makes it able to be moulded and bent. Uh, because the layers can actually move within that structure. That's in a pure metal. If you have an alloy, on the other hand... Okay, so you take an alloy. When you make an alloy, you add in different sized atoms. And that actually disrupts the layers that you've got. So, whereas I used to have nice layers, if I've got some bigger atoms in there, 
it messes up my layers and they don't fit nicely into a shape anymore. Okay, because these big atoms are in the structure and that stops the layers sliding. Okay, so that stops the layers sliding or prevents the layers from sliding. Okay. And that makes it stronger. Because the layers can no longer slide over each other, it makes the whole structure much stronger. So that's an alloy compared to a pure metal. Okay. So that's the difference between it. Okay. And that's, that can actually help. Uh, also means we can have lots and lots of different uses for steel. We can get a lot of uh, different things out of it. Um, problems could be we're, we haven't got an infinite supply of iron. Metals actually, a lot of metals are becoming more uh, expensive as we're running out of them. So we should recycle them. Recycle means they get melted down and remoulded into a new shape. So it, it prevents us from running out of metals uh, such as iron. But other ones could be, could be talked about as well. Uh, we shouldn't just reuse it as it is because it may be damaged, so you shouldn't really just reuse the iron uh, straight as it is. It needs to be sort of moulded, melted back down, uh, made sure it's all solid and safe again because it could be damaged. Uh, but if we just threw it away and it ended up in a landfill site, it would, would take a very long time for it to sort of rust away, uh, and decompose, and that would obviously mean that it was filling up landfill sites. So it's not a good idea to just throw it away in these metals. Uh, particularly as they're becoming more and more precious um, as, as, we, as we run out of them. Uh, that's about iron. This is a bit about extracting copper. So extracting copper uh, is an important process. You need to know a few different types of how you extract out copper. Okay? You've got smelting, uh, which is used for high-grade ores. High-grade ores mean where you've got lots of metal in it. So it's definitely worthwhile you extracting the copper from it. Uh, smelting is where you take copper sulfate, that's what you find in the ore. So you've taken a rock out of the ground, it contains copper sulfate, uh, and you're going to smelt the copper uh, out of it. You can tell smelting involves sulfur, so that's what you can remember about that. Smelting is to do with sulfur. You actually react it with oxygen, and it actually produces the copper and sulfur dioxide. Okay, sulfur dioxide is produced, and because I know you've made that link already, when you hear sulfur dioxide, you immediately think acid rain. Okay, so it's not great for that. Okay, because it produces sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain. Um, I've seen it come up a very few times where they say they can actually trap this sulfur dioxide in the smelting process. When it goes up a chimney, uh, those gases are escaping. Before they get out into the atmosphere, they actually have. Uh, a substance in there that will capture it and react with it. It actually neutralizes it before it leaves and uh, stops it going up into the clouds and producing acid rain. Uh, I've only seen it sort of come up once, but it's worth mentioning. Um, so copper sulfate plus oxygen gives us our copper and sulfur dioxide. The copper at this stage we receive is not pure though. It's not a pure version of copper. So um, we need to purify it. And how we purify it is a process called electrolysis. Um, electrolysis in C1, you don't need to know lots of detail about. It comes up again in C2, and when we do the live stream from that, I'm sure, I'm sure I will go through electrolysis. But at this stage, all you really need to know about electrolysis is it is purifying a metal using electricity. Okay, so it actually separates a metal from the impurities using electricity. And why is that bad is because electricity is energy. So you're wasting energy, and to get that energy, you also need to burn a fossil fuel. So it's also uh, burning a fossil fuel, creating carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide leads to global warming. Okay? So extracting using electrolysis is not great because it uses a lot of energy. That's if there's a high grade ore, so that means there's a lot of copper in that rock that you can get out, you can smelt it out, smelting sulphur. If it's a low grade ore, so if there's not much copper in the rock, you might do one of these two processes. Uh, you can do phyto mining, phyto mining, now that starts with a P, and that actually uses plants, you actually use plants to extract the copper. That's how you can remember that, phyto mining is to do with plants. 
What you do is you actually have that low grade ore and you sort of crush it up and then you actually get plants to grow on the rocks containing the copper. And they actually absorb the copper through their roots. They actually take it up as a mineral. They absorb it and it goes into the plant itself. You then harvest the plant, you cut it down and you burn it. And when you burn it, you extract the copper out of it. So you take the copper out of it. Still that copper needs to be purified, so it still need to undergo electrolysis, which is a big cost in terms of money uh, and electricity and energy, but uh, that's how you can extract the copper from the plant. Okay? So phytomining, the key bit is it involves plants. P, phytomining, P, plants. Okay? Bioleaching, okay, bioleaching involves bacteria. B for bioleaching, B for bacteria. Okay? So, this is another one for low grade ores. You actually put bacteria, this is a picture of some bacteria, onto the rocks and they actually eat away at the copper that's in those rocks. But they don't actually use that copper, they produce it as a waste material. And you can isolate that waste material along with the bacteria um, and you can extract the copper out of it. And when you do, um, you've extracted out the copper uh, and you're left with your impure copper which you have to purify through electrolysis again okay so that's bioleaching the key points really you don't need to know tons of detail the key bit if you remember anything is phytomining is plants bioleaching is bacteria and smelting produces sulfur dioxide which can lead to acid rain they're the kind of key points about how you extract out copper okay We've had about an hour and ten minutes. Now, I would like say we're at a point where I could do some questions, but we still haven't had any particular questions come in, which clearly means you think I'm doing such a great job at explaining everything um, that you don't need to ask questions because I'm literally covering everything you need to know. But do remember that you can have a specific question about a certain thing, and it will allow me to, to answer your question. You will have the opportunity for me to tell you exactly what you need to know for the exam tomorrow. Okay, so do bear that in mind. Okay? Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left, 15, 20 minutes left. I've got a few things to cover. Okay? Cover a bit on plant oils. Uh, <coughs> plant oils, we talked about biodiesel earlier. Plant oils can be used as biodiesel, but they can be used for, for other things as well. We use, we use a lot of plant oils for cooking food. An advantage to cooking food in um, plant oils is that if you compare it to boiling uh, a food, so let's, let's take potatoes as an example, if you boil potatoes, uh, some people don't particularly like the texture or the taste of boiled potatoes, but most people like the texture and the taste of chips. Okay? Because oils boil at a higher temperature, you can cook food a lot hotter, which means you can get it much more crispy, um, which people prefer as well. So there are advantages to cooking food in oils. Now, an advantage to cooking food in oils can be that it actually provides more energy to the food because oils are fats and they provide energy. That could also be considered a downside or a disadvantage, okay? The fact that they add energy to the food because that can mean the food is fatty uh, and can lead to, obviously, health problems. So that can be an advantage or a disadvantage, okay? But the point is plant oils can be used to cook food at a higher temperature than water. So therefore, um, you, can, you can get a nicer flavour or a nicer texture to the food. The two ways you extract uh, plant oils from plants is you can take the seeds and you can press them. Okay? That literally means you crush them up in a big industrial uh, crusher and it crushes the oil out of them. Okay? So you collect the seed from the plants, you crush them down and you actually filter off any impurities like the, the shell casings and the things like that that are left over and you get the pure oil um, out at the end. An example of this would be sunflower oil. So you take sunflower seeds, you crush them up, you filter off all the casings and everything and you're left with the oil which you can bottle up and then sell in the supermarkets. Another process to extract uh, plant oils can be distillation. This is where you take a whole plant uh, such as a lavender plant, which you may have seen before. Um, the, the oil has a nice smell and they use it in bath uh, products. Um, so you put the plant into water, uh, you probably crush it up a bit first, 
uh, to release some of the oil from it and you actually boil that water. So you heat it up till it's boiled. Both the water and the oil will evaporate. They'll evaporate together. Uh, and then you collect the oil and water by condensing it back to a liquid and when you've collected that you'll see that the oil and water uh, separate and you can actually separate out the oil from the water. Uh, so you can get plant oils that way. So the two ways, pressing, crushing the seeds, extracting out the oil uh, and filtering off the, the cases or distillation, crushing up the plants, putting them into water, um, evaporating the oil and water and then collecting the oil when it separates out. Okay. A key point about plant oils are that they are unsaturated. Unsaturated means they contain a carbon-carbon double bond. Carbon-carbon okay. carbon double bonds uh, mean that they're unsaturated. It also means that if you add bromine water to a plant oil, uh, the bromine water will go from orange to colourless because it's unsaturated. You do sometimes get asked about comparing it to saturated fats. Now, saturated fats usually come from animal fat, uh, and they contain carbon-carbon single bonds, um, and for that, they wouldn't make bromine water go to colourless. It would stay as orange. Remember, it only goes colourless if the substance is unsaturated. Okay? Now, the oils that are unsaturated um, can sometimes be useful for cooking and things like that, uh, but people actually like margarines and spreads made from uh, plant oils that are actually uh, like unsaturated. So generally, unsaturated compounds are considered better for your health than saturated. So unsaturated fats so are generally, you might have heard it, uh, considered healthier. The problem is with this is it's an oil. And uh, most of you probably wouldn't want to spread like vegetable oil onto your toast in the morning. You'd want margarine. So there's a process called hardening uh, that you need to know a little bit about. And hardening is where you take an unsaturated oil, unsaturated oil with a double bond. So this is just part of the chain. Okay, so this is part of my uh, oil. And we can tell it's unsaturated because it has a double bond in it. And we actually add to that hydrogen. We actually add hydrogen. This is hydrogen, or H2 if I've written it out, with a single bond between them. And it actually adds to the double bond. So it adds to here, and it adds one hydrogen there and one hydrogen there. And actually breaks open this single bond. So you end up with a substance which... has all single bonds. Okay? So this substance has all single bonds in it. And it's actually been hardened, the clue's in the name, hardened from an oil, a vegetable oil, into a spread. Okay? So that's what we can do with our vegetable oils. We can harden them into spreads. And the way we do that is we add hydrogen, and you need to know a couple of the conditions for the process. The conditions needed are a nickel catalyst. Nickel catalyst and about 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, we'll do it. So they are the conditions to harden our vegetable oil into a spread by adding hydrogen using a nickel catalyst about 50 degrees Celsius. So another reaction of, uh, <coughs> like, this is like a hydrocarbon, an unsaturated hydrocarbon. This one didn't come from crude oil. By the way, I've left these lines here in case you're wondering because this is just a small part of the chain. This would be a really long molecule that would go on for lots more carbons, which I can't fit onto my board. And similarly here, it's going to carry on. But I'm only interested in this bit, the double bond. This is the bit that hydrogen gets added to to make it saturated. Okay. This substance would turn bromine water colourless. Uh, it starts as orange, it would go colourless. This substance would the bromine water would stay orange. Okay? So that's uh, extracting plant oils and uh, using them for cooking 
because they boil at a higher temperature, they have more energy, uh, provide more energy to the food, you get a crispier texture and a better taste. Okay? Looks like we've had one question come in, so I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we can go through that. Um, before we do, I want to talk about emulsions. Emulsions are an important topic. Okay? They are to do with this picture up here. Now I said when I was talking about extracting this uh, oil, uh, that oil and water don't mix. If you've ever seen it, if you pour water uh, uh, into a container and pour oil on it, it will sit on top in a separate layer. Okay? They are called immiscible liquids. You don't necessarily need to remember this word, you just need to know that they don't mix. Okay? So oil and water don't mix. But some products we really enjoy rely on mixing oil and water together. Examples are mayonnaise, ice cream, or cosmetics such as face cream. They all rely on oil and water mixing together. Uh, milk is a, it has oil and water in it that's mixed together. Now, um, you have to add, to get those two things to mix, oil and water, you have to add what's called an emulsifier. An emulsifier is a substance that has a hydrophobic tail. Hydrophobic literally means hydro is water, and phobic means to hate. If you have a phobia of something, you hate something. Okay? If you have arachnophobia, you're, uh, you have a fear of spiders. I think it's called, is it claudiophobia or something? It's a fear of clowns, which is an actual phobia. Um, and then you have a head to it, which is hydrophilic. And that means uh, to love something. Hydro is water, philic is to love. So this loves water. So the tail actually likes oil, and uh, the head actually likes water. So what happens is, this circle here is actually a droplet of oil. Okay? This is a droplet of oil, which you have all of these hydrophobic tails sticking in. Okay? And the hydrophilic heads go around the outside. It causes the oil to separate into tiny little droplets, um, which will separate out in the mixture. So you're left, left with a creamy like texture, like mayonnaise or ice cream, rather than big lumps of fat in the water. You're left with little droplets. Okay? It's also in detergents, such as like fairy liquid. It allows oil that you might have on your hands or on your pans when you've been cooking to mix with the water and actually separate out, and you can separate out that water. Okay? So you can clean off the oil. Um, this diagram is a great one to draw. If you're asked how an emulsifier works, or how do you form an emulsion, or how do you get oil and water to mix, you can do this diagram. Okay? As I've said many times now, um, if you don't know how to write an answer to a science question, you can just do a diagram to show it. You need to label it with the hydrophobic tail sticking into the oil droplet, and the hydrophilic heads around the outside in the water, and there will be lots of these droplets in the, in the water phase, in the water, which will cause these two layers to become mixed. And you will just see them as one layer that's mixed all together. Okay? So our question, which has been emailed in, is a quite a short question. It's how do we remove calcium carbonate from water? Um, it's a good question, but we'll just quickly do it here. Calcium carbonate uh, is a solid. So calcium carbonate is actually a solid. Um, and if you have bits of a solid in water, so this is my conical flask, and that's uh, my like water in here, I can have tiny bits, tiny bits in the bottom of calcium carbonate. Okay? And if I wanted to remove them, I could filter them. Okay? When I do a filter, I have my funnel, and I actually have my filter paper. And then I have a flask to collect it in, and if I pour my mixture into there, the solid calcium carbonate will collect in the filter paper and all the liquid will run through, uh, drip down and fill up my flask. Okay, so I can actually separate uh, the solid calcium carbonate from the liquid. Okay. This is actually a good thing for when I talked about fermentation. Okay, one of the processes of fermentation, you have to add yeast to your sugar in water mixture uh, and the yeast actually creates the ethanol from the uh, glucose from the sugar that's in the solution 
To separate out your yeast at the end, your yeast will be solid and your water and ethanol solution will be liquid. The first stage is you pour it to filter off the uh, yeast particles which will be solid. So that's a good question from the perspective of if you want to ever remove a solid, calcium carbonate is a solid, from a liquid such as water, you filter it. So filtration is the method. You need to make sure you've got your funnel, your filter paper, and a flask to collect the liquid that will go through. Okay? This substance down here, it's unlikely to come up, but it's worth noting that this is called the filtrate, and this is called the residue that's left up in the top. Okay? We've covered a lot of things in the session. Uh, we're getting towards the end, okay? And the last thing I'm just going to briefly go into, and if there were any more questions, I'd, I'd try to answer them very quickly, particularly if they're short questions like that, um, is structure of the earth. Now, if a question comes up on this, I'm sure you geographers are going to be going, great, uh, I see that Miss Berlin's done some good revision videos uh, that she's uploaded to the revision website that you can probably see on there now. So if you're a geographer, I suggest you, uh, you can um, check those out as well. And uh, Miss Berlin can pay me my commission later. Um, the structure of the earth though, which you will see on that, this is what you need to know for C1, okay, for science. Um, the earth is almost a sphere, like this. Its main layers that you need to know, starting with the outermost, which is on the outside, is the crust. And the crust, what you need to know about that, is that's a really thin layer. If you imagine the earth as a football, the crust would be the, just the level on the outside, a really thin layer, okay, it doesn't make up much of it. Saying that though, it's still about six kilometers deep, straight down, so we haven't ever got through the crust to any of the layers underneath. We actually know about these layers through studying of seismic waves, which are waves that come from earthquakes. And it could come up, could ask you that, seismic waves or earthquakes is how we know about the structure of the earth. Okay? So the crust, relatively thin and rocky, it contains most of the uh, substances we need for our everyday lives is found in the crust. The mantle is the layer underneath. The mantle is actually a solid, but it flows a bit like a liquid, so it can act a bit like a liquid, which is really important um, later on for the next bit I'm going to do on continental drift. Okay? But the mantle is actually has the properties of a solid, but is flowing very, very slowly as well. And the core, you get the inner and the outer core, but usually in science we can just group them together in the core. Um, that's made from liquid nickel and iron in there. Okay? Uh, it is incredibly hot, that's what you need to know about it. And I'll go on to the next slide, but it's hot because there's radioactive decay happening inside the core. Okay? That's what's going on in there. The reason we need to know a bit about the structure is because it's linked to this guy, Alfred Wegener. Uh, I hope I'm saying his name right. It's actually because the crust is broken up into a series of sections, and those sections are called tectonic plates. And those plates are able to move on the top of the mantle. They're able to move about, and they are moving slowly. Uh, he noticed this because of a few things. He noticed that the, when he looked at a map of the, the world, he saw that some of the, the countries or continents looked like they fitted together, and he came up with this idea. At the time, people didn't know about the structure of the earth underneath, so they weren't certain he was correct, they didn't believe him, uh, but it's since been proven that he is correct, and these are moving, these plates are moving. Um, because this layer, the mantle, can flow like a liquid. To explain the process, you need to break it down to steps, and again, this is the sort of thing you'd need to talk about in an exam for the marks. Okay? The first step is, the mantle is kept hot because of radioactive reactions or radioactive decay in the core. It produces lots of heat and keeps the mantle hot. That warms the mantle and produces a convection current. And that's exactly the same in physics where a convection current where the mantle gets less dense, rises up, cools and sinks back down. It creates a convection current which is like a cycle. And that causes the plates on the surface of the mantle to move about slowly. Okay? If those plates come together, various things can happen. You don't need to know as much detail about what will happen as you do for geography, uh, but you do need to know at the, at the plate boundaries, where the plates actually meet, there is an increased risk of 
earthquakes where the plates slip past each other, mountain ranges can be formed when they get pushed up, uh, and details like that. But in geography you actually need to know more about it than you do for science. You need to know the basics of it for science. Okay? Uh, so that's continental drift. Okay? And the last thing I'm going to talk about just in the last few minutes we've got is just to do with uh, gases in the air and how they have changed. Okay? You need to know the rough percentages of gases that make up the air that we have today. Okay? It's mainly nitrogen and it has been for a long time. It's about 78% nitrogen. Okay? It's about 21% oxygen. And the other gases are mainly argon, nearly 1%, and a small amount of carbon dioxide. So even though scientists talk about carbon dioxide being a big problem, it is actually only a relatively small amount. Okay? But it is still contributing to global warming, and we're still making that link, so we're still going to be able to get it. Okay? Um, the early atmosphere wasn't the same as this, and we'll look at how it's changed uh, on the next slide, right at the end. But we actually know that the air is like this because we've been able to separate uh, the gases using fractional distillation. It's different to how it's done on crude oil, because this is done at a very cold temperature. They actually cool it down to about, about minus 200, and then they let it warm slowly up. And some of the uh, gases will evaporate when it warms up and will float out the top, and some will stay as liquids and run out the bottom. Nitrogen gets separated because it boils at a higher temperature. It's still negative, but a higher temperature than oxygen, so nitrogen floats up and floats out the top. Oxygen and argon are very difficult to separate because their boiling points are so close together. Okay. Um, I haven't talked about the theories for how life began on Earth, which can come up, which is a topic in, in C1. Uh, you need to know a bit about the Miller-Urey experiment, but it's very rare it comes up. It's to do with gases in the atmosphere and what they started as and how life began. And you should have some ideas of some of the other theories as well. The gases in the air have changed over time. Uh, this will be the last bit I'll do. Um, Mainly, the gases in the atmosphere started uh, with a lot of CO2, a lot of carbon dioxide, because it was very volcanic, the Earth, and that was releasing huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There was also moisture in the air as well, which eventually cooled down and it condensed into the oceans that we've got. Some water probably arrived from meteors as well, or asteroids that came into the Earth's atmosphere and dropped the water onto the surface of the Earth. Okay. But the main thing is, the Earth's early atmosphere contained lots and lots of carbon dioxide. Eventually, plants and algae evolved. These were the first simple like, forms of life. After bacteria, it evolved into plants and algae. And algae, if you don't know, that's what this picture is of. It's like the stuff you get in ponds, the green stuff. It's like a tiny little plant. And because it's a tiny little plant, it does photosynthesis. Okay. Photosynthesis takes in CO2, which I said the atmosphere was mainly CO2, and converts it into oxygen. So the levels of CO2 dropped dramatically and the levels of oxygen rose up as plants began to photosynthesize. Okay. That led to the next stage, the next change, where animals actually evolved. Okay. Animals started to evolve and they didn't do photosynthesis, they relied on the oxygen that was in the atmosphere. And they did respiration. So they used up some of the oxygen that was uh, produced by the plants and they released CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay. And that's now reached a stable state where it's about these percentages of gases in the air. Okay. So, just left to say, thanks very much for tuning in. Okay. Hopefully uh, it's been a help for your exam tomorrow. Remember it's 9am. Uh, I will be in tomorrow morning, um, early, uh, I'll probably be in room 103, um, if you want to come and see me, if not I'll be in the office, um, and good luck in your exam tomorrow, hope you've enjoyed it.